Welcome everybody to our first hangout from Bright Ideas Press. This is our first monthly hangout, but it is not our last. We have monthly hangouts scheduled for the second Tuesday of each month, October 2013 through March of 2014. We would love to have you hang out with us every month, the second Tuesday of the month. You can find the information about all the Hangouts at brightideaspress.com slash Hangouts. Uh, we are operating live from the Google Plus event page. And again, if you want to come over, you can find that at brightideaspress.com slash Hangouts. If you're already inside Google Plus, you are exactly where you need to be to comment and interact with us. So I see some of you out there are watching. Let's say hi to Susan and Tina and Melissa. Thanks, you guys, for being out there. We see you, and we'll be bringing in some of your questions and comments. So please feel free to write things on the event page now, during, and even after. And if we don't get to your question, hopefully we can follow up after the event and interact with you. So let's get started. First of all, I want to introduce the panel to you. Uh, Judy, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Judy Hoke. I'm a homeschool mom of seven, soon to be eight, and my children range in age from 18 down to two. I'm looking forward to a lot of homeschooling yet in the future. This topic today is one that's especially interesting to me, so I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you, Judy. Next we have Maggie Hogan. Hi, I'm Maggie Hogan, and um, my husband and I started Bright Ideas Press back in 1991 or two somewhere. We homeschooled our two sons all the way through high school. And since I have one hands-on learner and one hands-off learner, I think this is a, a great discussion and I think it'll be really interesting to, to hear different sides of it and maybe get some ideas from both sides of the, of the fence. Thank you, Maggie. We're so glad you're here. Uh, Tissa, can you introduce yourself? Okay, Tisha, I'm sorry, we can't hear you right now. Can anybody hear Tisha? No, okay, Tisha, I'm sorry, honey. We're going to um, try to give you some time to work out those problems, and we're going to move over to Tyler. Tyler, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Tyler Hogan. I'm Maggie Hogan's son. I'm the hands-on learner of the two of us. And I work full time for Bright Ideas Press, mostly doing curriculum development and project management, helping to write and get the stuff that a lot of you guys use and like out to you. So that's my job, and I like it. Great. Thank you so much, Tyler. And just a note to the panelists, if you'll remember to mute yourself when you're not talking, and that will keep the camera focused on the person who is talking. Um, okay, just wanted to welcome again everybody, and if you're watching recorded, we're so glad you are. This, uh, these Hangouts are for all homeschool moms, whether you use Bright Ideas curriculum or not. We want to welcome everyone to be part of the community and to participate in these Hangouts with us. And today we're talking about hands-on versus hands-off learning. There are different ways uh, to teach our kids, and hands-on learning is hugely popular but it might not be the best choice for everybody, and that's what we're going to investigate today. So my first question is simply, what is hands-on learning? So who would like to tackle that question first? Judy, could you tell us what you think of when you hear hands-on learning? Well, I would consider in my homeschool experience anything that involves the child's uh, hands-on efforts, creative projects that are hopefully engaging their senses in a fresher way than a textbook might. Anything that would that would at all stimulate and add to their learning experience. Okay, great answer. Yeah. Maggie, what do you think? You know, it's funny, you would think that there would be a simple definition for hands-on, but actually some people consider making a poster hands-on, and other people would say, that's not hands-on, that's just bigger printing. So I think hands-on um, is hard to define, and I think that different people go, oh, well, I don't do hands-on, but 
maybe they do and vice versa. So when you say hands-on and you're talking about a project, I think it's important to say, well, this is a simple you know, coloring project versus this is getting out the Play-Doh and making something project. So your hands-on just means different things to different people. That's a good distinction. Thanks for bringing that out, Maggie. Um, Tisha, are you with us here? Can we hear you? No? Still no? Okay. Tyler, tell us about hands-on learning. Well, I'd say hands-on learning is just anything that intentionally makes use of multiple learning styles. So whether that's visual or kinesthetic or auditory learning styles, but anything that you do to help make whatever you're learning stick. Yes, that's great. Thanks for those definitions. So uh, Judy pointed out that hands-on learning is often in contrast to a textbook. Um, and so I, I do think we tend to contrast traditional, maybe public school learning uh, with a hands-on approach. And we know as homeschoolers we have a great advantage to be able to do hands-on learning where a classroom can't. So I'd love to hear some of your killer hands-on projects. And it can be last week, 10 years ago. What were some of the memorable hands-on experiences that you've had in your family? Judy, why don't you start with us? Well, having a family filled with mostly hands-off learners, we've had fewer hands-on experiences than some, except I love Tyler's definition, anything that engages the senses. In that sense, we qualify. My visual learners, my auditory learners, um, tend to head for piles of extracurricular reading and uh, videos, field trips. And I do have one child that's a hands-on learner, and he actually chose to take chemistry last year simply because he wanted to do the experiments involved. So that, that one experience is the biggest experience I've had so far with anything that actually involved the hands. Mm -hmm. Good. So Maggie, I'm sure you have some great memories. Share some <laughs> of the killer hands-on experiences. Uh, literally. Um, <laughs> Well, we've had many fun and disastrous um, projects over the years. I think what makes it memorable for us is getting in there and knowing that oftentimes we don't get the results that we expected to get, but we learn something out of the experience. Uh, for example, um, we've done volcanoes every which way. Name a way of making or doing or showing a volcano, and we have done it. But the best way was the simplest way, and that was the way when one day I was, I love volcanoes, sorry, I think it's a blow up, just are so cool. Um, but you know, the traditional baking soda and vinegar is not really a true replica of how a volcano, what makes a volcano erupt. So I, it was morning, and we had my two sons and a couple other kids around the kitchen table. And we were talking about volcanoes, and as I'm explaining how the gases are held in, under pressure, you know, under the earth, and how the magma and the, has to move, and the, how, you know how the, the the bubbles bring up the, explaining all this, but their eyes are glazing over, and so I pull out a diet coke from the refrigerator, which was sort of unusual. I don't usually drink them at you know nine o'clock in the morning, and as I'm talking, I start shaking the coke. Well, now they're really paying attention. Why is she shaking the coke? And then I explained how it was under pressure, and the carbon dioxide is under pressure. And so when you release, and uh, like a vent in the surface of the earth, when you release the tub, what happens? And they're like, oh, you know, it, it erupts. They're like, exactly. But then I released it and sprayed them all. So it was very memorable. And I think they... <laughs> They weren't expecting it, and I don't think they've ever forgotten that. that that's so you sprayed Diet Coke all over your yeah, kitchen it, or wherever. It, yeah, see, in retrospect, if I had planned on doing this, I would have done A, outside, and B, I would have used Sprite because, or, you know, something that wasn't color. Cause, but that's the kind of thing that, like I say, it wasn't how I – I just planned on talking about it, but the whole thing of just – it's just too much fun. You might as well spray them. And, but it's very memorable. Yeah, right, Tyler? Sure. Remember this, right? Tyler, do you remember that? <laughs> oh, yes. I remember lots and lots and lots of volcanoes at our house. <laughs> um, Tyler, I'm sorry. Tyler, when you get a chance, my battery is almost dead, and I can't figure out how to plug this thing in. Sorry, guys. Okay. I'll be there in just a second. So, Tyler, do tell us uh, some of your most memorable uh, experiences as a homeschool graduate and then now with your young children. 
Okay. Well, one of my favorite hands-on memories from, uh, uh, I guess it was in elementary school, maybe junior high, we were studying biology, and we were doing cells, and we decided we were going to make a 3D model of a cell, and we took a big, clear glass kitchen bowl, and we mixed up a bunch of green jello, and we just used a bunch of different foodstuffs as the different cell organelles. So we had a, a hard-boiled egg as the nucleus, and wet spaghetti noodles that we layered throughout as the endoplasmic reticulum. And that's the only reason I still remember the word endoplasmic yeah. reticulum is because they were the spaghetti noodles. And we just had all kinds of things, you know, little peppermint pieces for the mitochondria and this, that, and the other thing. And by the end, you know, we, we kept layering things one on top of the other so that it was a 3D model of the cell and you just add a little bit more jello each time. And by the end, there was this amazing model. And then we got to eat it. And I remember it just having so much fun eating our big jello cell. And it was, it was a blast. That is fantastic. I think uh, we're talking about involving the senses, right? So getting yeah. taste and smell in there as well. That's great. I love that idea. Yeah, um, it was great because not only did it involve making a neat model and having the cool visuals, but you got to eat it. And anytime you have boys, food projects tend to go over well, unless you just burn everything. But that's pretty rare. If there's food involved, they're highly motivated. Make sure it turns out well. Mm -hmm. That is great. I love that. Uh, we have a comment from Susan that I want to share. Uh, this sounds like a great activity. Susan Evans says, we changed a closet downstairs into an Egyptian tomb, complete with life-size sarcophagus with my daughter wrapped in toilet paper. <laughs> That caused them to internalize the time period, and I'm sure those children will always remember when mom made a tomb in the house. That stuff sticks with you. Tisha, mm -hmm. I know you use a lot of hands-on with your boys. Uh, could you share some of the killer hands-on activities? Okay, we're, having, we're still having technical difficulties, Tisha. We cannot hear you. Are you muted? Top right. Okay, well we're going to move on for that. So let's talk about this question, which is really the crux of what we're getting at today is, do all kids need hands-on projects? And Judy, I know your answer is that no, all kids don't need it. And so I want to hear uh, your thoughts on that, because this is not something that's commonly talked about. You're right. Homeschoolers value the opportunity to engage their children in a different way than a classroom setting normally would. I think there's probably no easy right or wrong answer. It really goes back to the learning style of the child. If a child is a hands-on learner, those, those things are much more necessary. Whereas my four uh, school-age children who really dread and groan and dislike the hands-on things benefit a lot more from other ways of stimulating their learning experience. So, so really, I, I'd say it basically depends on the learning style of the child. So how do you know, Judy? How did you learn? I mean, you talked about groaning. Is that how you knew that hands-on just didn't work for your kids? That was probably the biggest thing. They were they were dreading and <laughs> groaning and complaining, and I was completing most of the project myself because nobody else was interested. I think you can learn a lot from looking at what your child does to learn something that they're interested in on their own. If your child's interested in pursuing hunting or robotics, how do they search for that information for themselves? Are they watching a video and then trying to do something along with the video? That's probably a good indicator of a hands-on learner. And if you have one that picks up a book and you know, reads extensively about it, well, there you go. Maybe books are the key to that child's learning style. That is really good advice. So basically what you're saying is just observe your kids and go yeah. with their cues. So do you... Do you have you ever experienced any kind of like mom guilt or I'm an inadequate homeschool mom or I'm not doing it right because you've avoided the hands-on? 
Especially at the beginning I did. I was I think all new homeschool moms tend to be a bit insecure in their choices, especially when it goes against what all your friends are doing, what everyone in the homeschool group is doing. But um, it boiled down to the fact that I have to work with my family and God has given them exactly the learning style that they have. And if that doesn't fit with everybody else, well, we don't have to join the science fair. We don't have to join the history fair. We can go along on the field trips and, and learn in the way that best suits them. And I have to say, I really don't feel the guilt now because I'm seeing some success with the route that we've chosen. I am so glad. Maggie, you have the veteran homeschool mom perspective, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on the whole issue of, you know, feeling the pressure to have to do hands-on. You know, Jimmy, I'm, I'm just not one that feels pressured by what other people do. I think I was fortunate in the beginning because I was one of the only homeschool, I mean, I think I knew two other homeschoolers when we started homeschooling. I mean, it just wasn't it just wasn't really done around where we live and so I didn't I didn't know I didn't know about homeschool conferences or curriculum so I kind of invented my stuff as I went along so I didn't have that comparison maybe if I'd seen all the other things out there I might have had difficulty with that but in the beginning it was fortunate my oldest son has my learning style and that's read it and discuss it and we did great with that. It wasn't until Tyler came along, I was like, oh, that's not working. Uh, you know, plan B. Um, and then I realized that's when I, I didn't know the term learning styles, but that's when I realized that this is not going to work for him. We, we've got to do something different. Well, that's an important distinction that every child is different. I think another thing, too, and I don't know if, if, you're going to go there or not, but I think it's important to realize that it also depends on the season of life that you're in. It's one thing to be hands-on when you've got, you know, a six and a ten-year-old and maybe a twelve-year-old. It's another thing when you've got six children under age twelve. You have to marshal your resources. You have to be wise in um, only choosing the things that are worth doing. Not every project is worthwhile. <sighs> You know, some of you are just not. So if you're going to do a project, make sure it's one that's worth taking away your time and energy from something else that perhaps more needs to be done. So it's just, it's measuring, realizing that your time is 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 important and that when you've got a lot of young children, um, you're probably going to come back to these topics again later and maybe at a later date they'll get more out of a hands-on project than they might, you know, younger. And I think too that I, when you're so busy with the little ones, um, it's it's just that much harder to to do the hands-on. So, you know, don't cut yourself some slack. Just be realistic in what what your family, what your time will allow, and what your what your family situation is, and realize that what you didn't do this month or this year, you probably have the opportunity next month or next year to do, and not and not kick yourself over that. Well, I love what you're saying, Maggie, and I know you're encouraging the moms out there because uh, here, for example, is a comment that we're getting. Hooray for not feeling pressure. We do things our own way. Maggie, if you'll mute yourself, I can hear myself in your um, speaker. We do things our own way around here, no peer pressure, and I think that's a fantastic perspective to have. Uh, here's another comment. Susan Evans says, my best friend doesn't have the energy to do hands-on. She reads living books to her kids, and they learn a lot. And when you let your kids play alone, they will play hands-on their own without you planning anything for them. I think that's a brilliant uh, perspective there, and I have seen that same thing uh, pan out in my own experience. So we want to let everybody know that whether you're a hands-on learner or hands-off, you can still offer your kids a fantastic education. Tyler, I know you've got three little precious girls, so I'm curious, are you, do you think you're going to go a hands-on route with them, or is it too early to tell? Well, I know that our oldest is definitely a very hands-on learner. She is just always moving. Trying to get her to sit down and read a book is very challenging because she's just go, go, go all the time. She's, she's a, a fireball. So, but she loves it when we sit down and read a book and then we do something with it. Uh, like the other night, we've been, uh, we've been doing five in a row. She really likes five in a row because there's lots of activities on it. 
and we, uh, we've been reading a book that takes place in Japan, and so we had Japanese night for dinner. So we got a little low table, and we all sat on cushions around the table, and we made fried rice, and had Japanese music playing in the background, and wore kimonos, and the kids tried their hands at chopsticks, which was really amusing, but they loved it, and you know, they love it because they keep asking, hey, can we do it again? Can we do it again? Can we have Japanese night again? And that's just a really neat thing to see. You know it's sticking. Uh, and they, they talk to you about it afterwards. You know, when it's not school time, they keep bringing it up. And that's how you know that, yeah, this is, this is working for them. They're getting something out of this. That is great, and I love that you're taking cues from them. Um, Lynn Schott is on the outside watching uh, from the YouTube channel, and she says, if your child's always picking things up, taking them apart, that's a huge clue. <laughs> she said her number third son was Destructo Boy. So, you know, <laughs> I think watching our kids and listening to them is so important. Uh, Tisha, we're going to try one more time, honey, and we're praying that it's going to work. Are you there? We see you. Can you unmute yourself and talk? <laughs> She's crossing her fingers. <laughs> Trying. I hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we can. Go ahead and talk. No, I'm sorry, Tisha. It's just not working, honey. I'm so sorry. Poor dog again. Um, popular again is not a thing. I was asking my kids. Yeah, I'm sorry, Tisha. It's, it's really garbled, and I am really sorry for the technical issues. I'm really sorry. It's just not working. How about um, you go to the event page and write some of those things that you want to share on the event page, and we'll bring them in that way, okay? I'm sorry. It's just not working out. Um, so let's talk about the mess because this is a huge obstacle for hands-on learning and we've already had a few people comment that I can't stand the mess, um, I don't want to deal with it, so uh, what are your thoughts on the mess and how do you cope with it? Is that a good reason not to do hands-on? So just jump in there about the mess. Well, if I could, um, we have not only the hands-on mess in our house, we've got a, a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a one-year-old, so there's just toys everywhere and it's almost hard to tell you know which is the toy mess and which is the homeschool mess and which is the whatever else mess and how do you put it all away and I like things really neat and clean I'm a fairly orderly kind of person so normally that kind of thing would just really really great on me and so for me some of it is just recognizing that it is messy and my house is probably going to be much messier than I like and for the next you know 16 to 18 years, and that that's really okay. It's it's not a sign of being a bad steward necessarily. I mean, if we're just slovenly, yeah, that's a bad thing, but it's a sign that we're using our house and we're using the stuff that God has given us, and, and so that's really, that's a good thing. But on the other hand, there's also lovely tubs and label makers and things that you can do to keep things organized. Um, I remember when, when I was a kid, we always would have a plastic tablecloth that was just tucked away under the table, and any time there was any kind of project, you bring out the plastic tablecloth first, and you just put that down, and all the mess stays on the tablecloth. And if you need to, you can take it outside and hose it down. Uh, we also had lots of like wet wipes and things just handy, especially when we were doing biology dissections on our kitchen table. and. Yeah, you, you want to make sure you have some disinfection handy <laughs> for stuff like that. So there are, there are definitely things that you can do uh, to cut down on the mess and to keep it manageable. You know, have a time set aside for cleanup. You know, build that into your activity time as the cleanup time because you can move on to the next thing and leave your mess out there or you can actually schedule an additional, you know, five, ten minutes to put everything away. And, it's amazing how big of a difference that five, ten minutes can make if you plan on it and the kids know that it's planned on. That is a brilliant tip and I think also uh, you're teaching them, you're just continuing the teaching into life skills, right? Cleaning up is something that a lot of people don't know how to do. They don't know how to do it well. <laughs> yeah. And so that is really important. I love your tip about the tablecloth and the wipes. That's great. 
Um, so, Judy, do you have any thoughts about this? Well, in a larger family like we have, the, the mess is definitely a, a deterrent to mom's thinking. But I, I do have a couple of children that enjoy art as long as it's not integrated with anything else. We can just do art separately. And it's just been uh, our habit. I started training them pretty young to clean up. What you know, if, if there needs to be newspaper down, that goes down first. When you're done, your things all get cleaned up and go away. I absolutely cannot go around cleaning up seven children's uh, art projects or whatever they're getting into. And I think, as you mentioned, it's it's part of the life training thing too, because hopefully they're going to be taking their cereal bowl to the sink in the morning too, and it's just an extension of the we clean up after ourselves rule. That's beautiful. I I have something I would add to that. Um, for me, certain kinds of messes put me over the edge. Other things don't bother me at all. For example, no glitter allowed in my house ever. I don't do glitter. Glitter makes me crazy. Any of that kind of, I don't know, stick of glue and glitter and cutting and pasting, little tiny pieces of paper, uh, but make slime, make gag, you know, any of that stuff I'm good with. So part of it is just knowing what's going to really irk you. I'm not going to buy my kids a big set of, you know, glitter and glue and things that I really don't want in the house because they make me nuts. So, I, you know, I have to know what my what my my triggers are because that, that will make me nuts. But also, I didn't plan to do hands-on every day. We had certain days set aside. So, for example, maybe we tended to do our subjects twice a week, uh, math maybe more, but history twice a week, science twice a week, once a week sometimes, and that would be the day that we would do a project, and that was the project day, and then we'd clean up. So I didn't have projects going every day either. Um, and then some things you just you just outsource. Uh, he talked about dissection. Yeah, I didn't do that. Ah, somebody else did that. They used my kitchen, but I don't, you know, you have to kind of know what your strengths and weaknesses are too. That's great, Maggie. I love those tips. Um, very practical. Doing it all in one day or kind of holding it back. And uh, you, you're definitely getting a lot of kudos from the outside, people saying that they love what you said about um, choosing the projects wisely. You don't have to do every single project. And uh, I, I think that's really smart. And not every project really teaches. Some projects are just for fun. And you can do them if you want. You don't have to. And some projects are really useful, like Tyler's example of the edible cell model. He still remembers endoplasmic reticulum after all these years. That really worked. I'm sure there are lots of other activities he's forgotten because they weren't as effective. So uh, another question I have is, what if your kids really love hands-on and you really, really hate it? How would you deal with that? Get over it. Uh, seriously, some things you just you just have to do. Um, I hate changing diapers, but you know you, you, you got to get over it. So not to say you have to do it every day or or anything, but you have to be you have to be fair to the child that God's given you, mm -hmm. and you have to respect the way that child is wired, whether it's the way you're wired or not. You don't have to love it, but you do have to get over it. I love that. that. I think you're wise to say that, Maggie. And I wanted to share, you know, Tish is having so many technical difficulties, and she said that her boys love reenacting battles. Um, wow, that is great. What a great way to learn. And I'm sure, again, like Tyler was saying, edible things are great for boys, so are battles. Uh, probably there are a lot of moms out there that would think that's not fun. But Tisha goes with it because she knows it's what her boys love. That, that is a, what a mom does, right? We sacrifice and we meet our kids' needs. It doesn't mean you have to do hands-on every day, but it does mean you need to be willing to compromise for them. I think that's great. And uh, let's share this thought from outside. Lynn Schott says, Maggie made a great point about choosing wisely. Pick a worthwhile project and just resolve that there will be mess. So I think that that's really good advice. Um, all right, well, uh, does anybody else have any big ideas that we didn't get to yet? I want to make sure you have a chance to share any stories or tips. 
Well, I was going to say one other thing in, in, in terms of, you know, if mom hates the hands-on, that's one thing that co-ops are great for, you know? You can outsource some of those kinds of things. You don't have to do it all yourself. Okay, we lost Tyler there for a second. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, now you're back. Okay. <laughs> oh, I was just saying, co-ops are great because you don't have to do everything yourself. If you are not an artsy craftsy person, find somebody who is and have them do the artsy craftsy parts, and you do the parts that you're fantastic at. You know, everybody has a learning style, but everybody also has a teaching style. And, and I think teaching styles tend to be more flexible. It's easier to adapt your teaching style than it is to try and adapt your learning style. But make use of the resources that are around you. Okay, great. Um, Maggie and Tyler, would you guys like to comment on the uh, hands-on aspect of some of the different uh, curricula lines in Bright Ideas Press? Well, sure. <laughs> What we've tried to do throughout the years in Bright Ideas Press is to have options because, like I said, my son's learned two different ways. I respect both those ways. And not to say JB never did hands-on because sometimes you just it, it lends itself or that Tyler never had to sit down and read a book. He did. But I like to have options for people. And what I think the one thing I would want to caution people is Sometimes when there are options, people see that as, oh, here's three options. I guess I need to do all three of them. Oh. Pick and choose, people. Pick and choose. You're going to you know, burn yourself into an early grave trying to do everything. So look through materials. And if you can, look through things ahead of time. There are plenty of times I had to wing it for whatever reason, and I only got to prepare you know, the night before or the morning of. But as much as I could, I would try to look ahead week to week and think which ones would really either my boys really enjoy and did they have worthwhile, were they worthwhile enough for me to spend time and energy and possibly money on. Um, so in Bright Ideas, any of our, any of our books, uh, study guides for example, we, we talk about science projects, we talk about history projects, Tisha mentioned doing forts, my boys loved doing battles and forts like that, Tisha, but also we don't think about literature and language arts as being um, possibly project-based. So in all of our study guides that we sell individually and both within Illuminations, there are often hands-on projects that tie into the literature. Um, so you can look at hands-on from a lot of different ways, but don't don't feel like just because there's 10 possible projects that you need to do all 10 of them. You know, be wise. So we do, but it is, we do try to give you a lot of options, but we don't want you burning out. Um, because it's better to homeschool the slow and steady, do a few here and a few there, than to go all out and then blow up and burn out. It's just not pretty when that happens because I've seen that before. <laughs> that is, I've, been, I've been there before actually once or twice. So. That is fantastic <laughs> advice and I really want to go back to this video and pull out all these nuggets and write them down because there are a lot of moms out there that need to hear this. Um, so you guys watching this video after it's recorded, you can embed this video anywhere you want and share it and so that people get the word that hands-on is great, but if your kids don't learn that way, uh, it's okay not to use them. It's okay to put limits on them. So, uh, go ahead. And I think there's also a lot of wisdom in realizing that because your kids are not always going to be in environments that are their ideal learning style, it's important for them to be exposed to learning things that are not their favorite way to learn. You know, I was the kid who was always fidgeting. I always had to have something in my hands. You know, if we were doing a family read aloud, if I didn't have silly putty or Legos or something, I was just going to be miserable. But it was also important for me not just to have the fun hands-on stuff, but to learn how to sit and do things. You know, classroom discipline uh, is, is useful in a lot of different contexts. And if your kid's real hands-on and real fidgety, you don't want to you know, make them miserable and have that be the only thing that you do, but it is useful. And even if your kids aren't super hands-on, it's useful for them to do some hands-on things too. So don't feel like your, your kid's learning style needs to completely rule 
there's value in doing things that will stretch them and get them to learn outside of their box. Wow, that is fantastic. Uh, so we have that for the mom coming out of her comfort zone a little bit mm -hmm. to meet the needs of her child. And then we have children also being pushed into areas that maybe aren't their favorite. So it's going both ways. I think that's really smart advice. So um, Maggie, Judy, did you have some? Yeah, I have a question actually. I wondered if Judy could share how she um, works hands on. She says she has seven, ch seven children, right Judy? I haven't experienced that. I mean, I've done co-ops and had large classrooms, but not seven living under my roof. How do you handle um, trying to to meet the range of your kids? With do you do hands-on projects when you do them together? I know you don't. I know that's not your major main learning style, but when you do something, are all your ch children involved? Or are you just doing it with the ones who learn that way? Or how do you work that in your family? Oh, you're oh. muted, Judy. I'm sorry. We have tried so hard um, to work the kids together and with the exception of one, they are such strong independent learners that they really don't like to be harnessed with their siblings to work in a group. And I'm like that, so I have to understand that. So typically I will assign um, timeline work or something that's going to involve a little bit of get your hands dirty type thing individually and uh, try to encourage them to work as independently as they can. My job being to supervise and to assist but not to control or run the whole project because obviously I can't be seven places at one time. That's good. I wanted to bring in some outside comments. Sure. Uh, Steph Layton says, hands-on projects also fill up the child with the love language of quality time. So she's looking at it also from the spiritual and emotional needs perspective and that's a good point. You know, doing the projects and the games with our kids can make them feel loved as well as meet their intellectual needs. Um, Renee says that when you do unit studies, the hands-on lessons can span many areas of learning. So you're not just focusing on one thing but you're getting an across the board perspective. Uh, we've got a lot of good nuggets from the event page. Uh, homeschool Blogging says use curriculum as a springboard. Don't be a slave to it. Um, oh, here's another one from the same person. Being a yes mom isn't always easy, but it can be so important to speak your kids love language. Um, all these things are so important and uh, I think we're going to wrap it up with a few closing thoughts. So anybody in the event room, if you have a question for any of these people, you need to quickly get that posted so we'll have a chance to uh, answer that. But otherwise, I think we're going to let each person have some closing thoughts. What would you like to leave everyone with? Judy? I think it's so important to realize whatever your child's learning style, that as long as you're doing your best to meet that, that's okay. And. I'm trying to remember, I think it was Tyler that mentioned that you can adapt or pick and choose what activities you're going to do. For my family, we use and love Mystery of History and All-American History, but we skip over all those fabulous projects, but that's okay. I have a, had the wonderful experience. My daughter just finished the first four lessons of All-American History, and no, she didn't do any hands-on anything, but in those four weeks, she read six books, biographies, autobiographies, um, a, a historical fiction series, and she would come over to my room late at night and her face just glowing to tell me what she learned in those books. History came alive to her. I, I'm not going to complain about the lack of, of projects. And so when you find what works for your child, go with it. Trust your instincts and just do your best to meet your child's needs. Whether or not it fits the typical homeschool mold, that doesn't matter. You can be a successful homeschool mom to whatever kind of student you have, whatever works in your family. It's, it's what's best and you can do it. That's great. Tyler, we need the applause sound effect right there. <laughs> I think that was... Yeah, that was good. Maggie, give us your closing thoughts. My closing thoughts aren't going to be a summation, but there's something that wasn't touched on I wanted to mention, and that is we talked about projects often, but we didn't talk about the performing arts as part of hands-on, and I know in Tyler's case that was very important that he was allowed to do mime and music and 
you know, clarinet and all the different acting, all the different things that he loved to do. And Jimmy, I think your daughter's very artistic and probably theatrical. That's hands on. It's not messy, it's not a project, but it's very hands on. And don't lose track of that. In fact, in the study guides I was mentioning, we often have a theatrical type or a performance based type of hands on because for some children that's really what they need to do. They need to express themselves through the arts and it's just another wonderful gift that God may have given them. So don't don't lose track of that as being a valuable hands on time. Wonderful advice. Tyler? Well, I loved what Judy had to say about finding what works for your kids, and I think that's absolutely true. And if it's hands-on, then go for it. If it's hands-off, then do that. But the point is you want them to find whatever you're doing interesting and exciting, and the primary way that they're going to find it interesting is if you, as a teacher, also make the effort to find it interesting. If you're bored by what you're doing, then you can't expect your kids to be excited about it. But if you make the effort to find out what is exciting about this topic or this time period or this idea, then your enthusiasm will be infectious. If you have a bad attitude, that will be infectious too. All of my most treasured learning memories come from times when mom or one of my other teachers was just so jazzed about what they had to share with us. And even if it was something really geeky and nerdy and like I would never otherwise be interested in this, because they thought it was awesome, it became awesome to me. And I've found that over and over again, you know, when I teach co-op classes, the lessons that I am most excited about become the ones that are most memorable. So whatever you're doing, to help your kids become lifelong learners, you need to model that first by lifelong learning yourself. Wow, brilliant advice. There's so much wisdom in this panel, and I appreciate all three of you coming out today and uh, being part. I feel like a lot of moms are going to get a lot of encouragement from this message. And just want to put in a plug for the upcoming Hangouts. Um, We'll be meeting again uh, next month, the second Tuesday of each month. We'll be meeting on November 12th, and our topic then will be adding geography to your homeschool. So we hope that you will join us at that time. <laughs> we have some serious geography geeks or nerds <laughs> over there on that side of the panel, and we love them dearly, and they have a lot to share. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>